DIA has chosen to honor patients like me this year with the President's Award for Outstanding Achievement in World Health. This award recognizes significant innovative contributions of an individual or a group of individuals or an organization to the improvement of world health. Jamie Haywood received this award on behalf of his organization earlier this week. So please welcome to the stage our President's Award recipient and our keynote speaker, Jamie Haywood. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take a moment here uh, since I've got you know industry and the regulators and I represent the patients and I'm gonna do a big hug. A group hug. A group hug. <laughs> All right. So um, on uh, Saturday night when I was at the board meeting and they gave the award, I accepted it on behalf of our quarter million members and the amazing team that have made patients like me come from being a, an idea, you know, a, a concept to, to what it is today, which I think is partway down the journey we need to go. But I wanted to give you a moment to sort of uh, get a sense of what got me into this, what drove me. Uh, and then I, to do that, I want to introduce our very first patient, who is my brother. And I'm going to play a short intro right now. I really could not imagine a better match for Jamie. Steven! Like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> and like Marge and Homer. <laughs> I'm Christopher Leiden. We're talking about ALS, an incurable disease. Stephen and James Haywood haven't accepted that. I have a brother who has maybe three years to live. The first thing Stephen said was, I guess I better go buy that Harley I've been thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> From the directors of the Academy Award-nominated Troublesome Cree. One day I said, I can't believe you have ALS. And he goes, eh, random. And that's Stephen. When his brother Stephen was diagnosed with ALS, Jamie became a guerrilla scientist. I just started printing things. What was this? What does this mean? Every trial. I'm going to draw how we're going to cure this disease right here in one chart. You got to be real careful here. Nothing will shut your program down faster than you go out there and say, on X works and it turns out it kills 25 people. That would be very bad. <laughs> uh, Steven, I don't know how to right now. How did you beat me? We built this lab before we knew we had the money for it. First year we raised $400,000. This year we raised $4 million. Where many feel powerless, they found strength. If we don't have this sense that we are on a great adventure, we're not going to make it. We're part of something that is great. Where many see tragedy, they found laughter. <laughs> I don't have to answer this, but can you guys make love? I know, I always said, the thing I'll miss most is the inability to spank. And when everyone said it couldn't be done. You know, what if what we're doing is impossible? It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. They didn't listen. There were $485.67 in the bank. We need to raise $400,000 between now and October. Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so much, so fast. If you could go back when you first got the disease, what would you want to say to yourself? Have no sex on film. <laughs> Stephen, um, Stephen was amazing. He uh, passed away in Thanksgiving of uh, 2006. Uh, what I like about that video, uh, besides the obvious self-promotion, is I think we all have our own Stephen. In fact, I, I, I can't think of a single drug that didn't come into existence without that same set of things, running out of money, the, the, the inspiration that drove someone into the field of medicine, the, the passion it took to drive through that, the sense, uh, as Robert said, of great adventure. Uh, I think even the moment of, you know, what really matters, you know, was it the inability to spank or, or having more sex in film? Is that an outcome that the FDA would accept as an improved measure? <laughs> Stephen would value that. Um, but, uh, you know, th this, is, um, this is a complicated problem. How do we connect the passion I, I love my friends in the industry. Um, when I first started out, it was actually them and, and actually, you know, the regulators that were really very supportive of thinking about new ways of doing things and, and approaching medicine. 
Um, and they, they were generous and giving, but I also, you know, they wanted to be held accountable. And I think this is about what this event is about today a little bit, about how do we connect to these individuals in new ways. I want to go through my last 15 years uh, and shortly and, and talk about sort of where I started and where it's going. And when I look about Stephen up here and I think about, you know, him, which I do often, I, I wonder about what the goal was. And we talked about this, you know, we want lifespan, we want extended health. There's a term I heard, and I don't know who coined it. I'd actually love to, if someone would know who came up with it first, I'd love to hear it. But the term health span really resonated with me. That was what I dreamed about when, when I used to talk to Stephen and patients in the beginning. And I had a slide with, you know, drugs that had achieved that, insulin and Gleevec and, and the triple cocktail and HIV. These were my fantasies for ALS, which is a disease that, you know, is lethal in, in on an average of three years. Um, and I thought to myself, because I'm an engineer, let's figure out how you accomplish that. So I studied the industry and I looked at how things happen. And that is, HealthSpan is the consequence, the hypothetical result of a process that involves the discovery of an idea, the development of that idea into something real that's usable in the real world, and then its delivery in the healthcare system effectively. That's, this is the, the process of producing HealthSpan. And you know, whether that idea is, is a new therapeutic or that idea is a, a heart transplant or a diet or a better way of living, it's still the same process. You have to discover the idea, invent it. You have to prove that it works and you have to make sure it's actually done. So when I started working in ALS, I started in the beginning of this pathway. I said, let's look at discovery. And one of the key things that we were looking at in discovery was how do we make mice that have a genetic form of ALS, not the form in my family, but a genetic form of ALS, live longer? And there's my brother, uh, my daughter, um, and uh, no, not wearing the glove, um, and then an SOD1 mouse in, in our first lab. And what we were doing was what all of us do when we try and make early discoveries. And whether it's an animal model or a cellular model or a protein-based model, we're looking for something like this, a paper that shows that our treatment made something different, better. Uh, I tend to think of blue lines. You want to be in the blue line in medicine. You want the blue line. And this particular paper from a friend of mine named Jeff Rostein at Hopkins um, was based on a series of mice uh, that lived longer when treated with Celebrex. And this was very exciting to me. This is right at the beginning of my brother's disease. And so immediately his doctor and I collaborated and he started on the drug at, at a very high dose to try and inhibit his progression of disease because he wanted to be in the blue line. But because I was starting a lab, I repeated the experiment. That was my, you know, I, I'm an engineer. I like to benchmark things. So I repeated it. I didn't get the same result. And I'm stubborn, so I repeated it four more times. And I didn't get the same result. Now, I'm also kind of quantitative, so I try to understand why I didn't get the same result. So one of the things that we did is we overlaid our control mice against the other studies in the field and showed that in this case, perhaps, rather than having a treatment that worked, something went wrong with the control group so it died faster. Now, this was challenging because my brother's now on the drug. I have this evidence that contradicts the prior study. This is a fairly common tale. And I didn't know what to do. So we did more work. And what we did is we took, this is uh, my animals from about 2001 to 2005. Um, and we, uh, to give you a sense of scale, by the way, um, every study published in the history of the field was about 2,500 animals total at this point in time. So we were running a big lab. And we took all these animals and we asked the question, if I simulate using a Monte Carlo simulator, it's a way of avoiding all the arguments about statistics. We just ran with raw horsepower the studies, the results. So there's the Celebrex study on the screen. You know, the, the, up here, a very big effect, 24, 25%, and, and lots of animals. Um, and we took that and we said, what if I look at that and every study ever published? So this is every study published by everyone in the field of ALS up until about 2005. And this is what happens in terms of the probability that they occur by chance if I simulated them from my control group. 
And the answer was anywhere from roughly half to most of the field never could have been significant in any way. And that's from one tight control group. Imagine less rigorously run ones. Now, this was a big deal. I didn't know what to do. It was a very depressing moment for us at the Institute to try and think about what to do because we had been basing all of our knowledge on this basic science in the field. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we did is we had a conference call every month where we read out to my brother and all of the other patients that were involved, this is what we think is the best shot. This is the best shot we got for you. And we would talk about how we were investing in that and we reallocate our resources. They were sort of our board of directors, as it were. And, and it was difficult. And what we ended up showing them was this data, that these were the major studies of the field on the left-hand side. And that was our repeat of them, including uh, five of the seven major studies that led to clinical trials in the field, all of which failed. We were kind of struggling with this. Uh, we published a big paper, Nature wrote a big scathing scandal. As usual in medicine, nothing changed. Um, now, we're not alone. Amgen uh, did some work uh, on, on, on replicating primary cancer targets and showed that they couldn't replicate 65% of the primary mechanistic discoveries that were published in a period of time. Bayer did work on, um, I'm, sorry, I'm reversing these two, the first one's the uh, Bayer paper, the second one's Amgen. But Bayer did work where they looked at molecules they bought, so they'd actually done the due diligence, invested in them, and they couldn't replicate 80% of them. So we have some real challenges in the first box of our unit here, discovery. And, and I skipped the dialogue about whether mice are the issue. Um, you know, in this case, I think the problem was the scientists, not the mice. But there, you know, it's, it's hard to do this, but there are some issues that, that legitimately make one concerned if you're a patient or a patient advocate about how to think about doing science. Um, again, another, another paper just came out of Nature from our lab uh, about how to do this better. So that's discovery, and that was my experience. Development is when we actually take those things that we've learned and we put them in human beings and we show they work. So this was the results in Celebrex, and the, uh, the blue line didn't look any different this time either. At this point, my brother had stopped taking the drug. Now, again, development is also an area where the world is really beginning to question whether they can trust scientists. Uh, you know, if you look at work from, uh, from, from uh, Jonathan Ioannidis, this is repeated studies that he's shown that, you know, again and again, they don't replicate, the statistics aren't following up. Um, there's a reporter in, uh, in the UK that's written a book called Bad Pharma after his original book called Bad Science. I don't agree with the motivational critiques he makes, but I do think that the, the facts are pretty solid, that, that the, the evidence is that we're selectively distributing data and we're doing that. And you guys all know this. As you you've dealt here, we're starting to make corrections in this. But I want to put this as a background to talk about how we come to this new relationship between patients and industry with some real honesty, because there are challenges in this process. It's not just the industry and scientific process, though. Um, and this is actually, I'll add one more. This is from Marcy Angel. Again, you guys all know this. It's the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. This is what patients are reading. It's no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. Now, it was a question was asked during a press conference earlier about what are we going to replace this with? This is all we have. And that's true. I mean, I think our evidence models are good. I think that the way the industry runs trials are excellent. I think that we have a lot of work to do about the amount of evidence, though, and how we communicate that. In the healthcare side, um, it's also difficult. This is data from our analysis. We just did a study on trials, and we showed that 20% of the patients would not basically go back into the trial they just came out of. If you ran a business with that kind of a failure rate, you'd be toast. I mean, you know, Howard Schertz that runs Starbucks is looking for 99.999% of return visits, and he sells drugs too, and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we probably all want some. Um, <laughs> But the patients are not getting that. We don't thank them. We don't send them the data. We don't send the reports. You know, we have to really think about this in new ways. But on the other side, in medicine, 
This is from 1999, so we're going back a while, 15 years. This is a report that showed that preventable medical errors, if they were inserted in the CDC's list of death at that point in time, would be the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, above diabetes. So this is not industry, this is the healthcare system, the people that are delivering our drugs. And, and on the healthcare industry side, um, you know, this is diabetes has gotten worse because we've gotten fatter, but it turns out that this is a new publication that came out in, uh, in September, that the new estimate of the rate of preventable medical errors is 210,000 people in the United States each year. Luckily, the rest of the world is better than us because um, they're less counter incentived but there are problems everywhere. So we have a lot to do. This is a, you know, a hor this is a horrendous data set to come to realize. And I, you know, went through this whole journey, in fact, you know, experienced it, that I treated my brother with data that ended up being refutable. We based, uh, we ran our own trials and were unable to get them to work. And then he had medical errors in the hospital. So I've been the personal experience of this. And if you think about it, each of us has had our own experience of this. So how do we do this better? And we need to do this better because in the end of the day, right now, we haven't gotten any more productive in 60 years, 70 years. If we're only producing 30 drugs a year when in an era where there are 7,000 diseases, the level of need we need to meet is, is unquenchable. We need to reinvent the whole system. All right, so everyone just take a moment and we're gonna pause, take a deep breath, It's a phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. I think that out of this problem comes the potential to reinvent a solution. Now, I don't wanna dismiss how important it is to celebrate the things that we have done. They are amazing. The advances in human health, the life sciences industry are are spectacular. They're among the most best amazing advances in our world. But every other industry has left us behind. The level of invention in technology, in finance, in, in consumer products, in, in every other sector of our economy has an exponential curve of growth and innovation, and we are flat. And it is time to embrace that new era. So let's talk about what that would look like. So after 15 years, what I would say the one thing that I have learned is important in all of healthcare and medicine is to solve for this problem. I shouldn't have worked on drugs for Stephen. I should have worked on biomarkers because I only had two or three chances to treat him before he died. If I'd had something that was able to detect an answer in weeks or months, we could have had many more shots on goal. In discovery or in healthcare, much, you'd much rather play basketball than play soccer or football, as it's called in the rest of the world. You want to score. You want to find things that work. You want to iterate. You want to make it better and better. And this is driven by this. And, you know, look at my breakthroughs, the ones that I had on my slide that I dreamed about. And how could I miss this at the beginning? Insulin, you could detect instantly the response. Gleevec. A $60 blood test tells you whether it works once you've identified the pathology and it could be done. That's how this was done, not by some fancy trial or some fancy architecture, but fast measurement and innovation. Otherwise, it never would have come into the world. The triple cocktail was tested illegally or a beyond IRB review on individual patients that they knew it worked right away because they could see the viral load come down. So the credit to those inventions really goes to the ability to detect and if that's the case, how do we work on that together? Because this is, to my mind, the missing part of this system. So there are two parts to this. The first is stratification. How do we know who we're talking about? It's basically phenotypic, environmental, and biologic variables that can stratify and allow for personalization. How do I know what makes me different from you? Because if I have half the wrong people in my trial, I need four times as many people to do it. And it costs four times as, sorry, four times as many people, it costs four times as much. It's an exponential variable. You only have 10%, the numbers get absurd. So we better know who we're talking about precisely and effectively. And I know we know this, 
But it's not a problem we think about strategically. It's something we come to when we have the treatment, not in how do we advance this all in the beginning. So the second thing is signal. How do we really understand how to measure and understand the human condition? And quite frankly, medicine is too much storytelling. It needs some math. It needs to really have some rigorous math. I mean, I'm at some level a manufacturing engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I want to know the numbers. I want to know what it is. I want a box around it. I want to define it. This is what we need to do to accomplish this change. This is the obligation we have to patients to be able to deliver this. Now, what do we do with this? Well, every patient comes to, you know, the world with their genetics, and their environment and their history. And that ends up being their expressed self. You know, it's the combination of those things that results in them. And we need to look at those people, so we measure that. And we do, you know, labs and imaging and clinical exams and pathology to understand the individual. Increasingly now, we're using things like sensors or behavior or PROs to measure how the state of the individual is, the inner being. And this is how we optimize and design for trials and think about measurement. We don't, by the way, do any of this in healthcare very well. It's not recorded in any quantitative way. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, a patient doesn't come into being in some birth state. They have a journey. And that journey has a series of, of components over it. And we have to think about medicine not as cross-sectionally, how do I measure this population versus this measurement, but how do I look at the vector the history of the individual and where they're going, because the history will teach us the future. To collect this information, what we've built at Patients Like Me, what we're thinking about, is how to take these narrative stories, the dialogue people give us about their lives, and turn it into something I call systems phenomics, which is basically, how do we know exactly what we're talking about? Specifically, when someone says insomnia, what does it mean? Specifically, when someone talks about depression, how accurately can you measure that? Specifically, what's the range of someone's ability to be mobile? Are we covering the full range? The precision, the biases in the measurement, the variation, the dynamics, how does it move over time? The relationships, what is it doing with other things? And this last one that was talked about so much, what's the meaning to the individual? I don't actually think spanking is actually a measure in our system, and I'm not sure I would code it to MEDRA or SNOMED. But, I mean, th if that's what's meaningful to someone, then we should track it, we should connect it, and do it in a computable way. What we do in medicine isn't accessible. We have to redesign ourselves not as, how do we discuss terminology and things that, so that we as experts can have dialogues, but how can we do things in patient-centered ways so that the patients understand it? That the, that the patients can answer the questions reliably, that it's efficient, it's relevant, educational. These are consumer skills. This is how you connect as consumer people. Some of you have to lock the doctor out of the room for this part of the conversation and bring that back to them and see if it's accurate. Harmless, by the way, is really important. You know, I, I, one of the things, we, we work a lot on mental health with patients like me, and you know, you could ask the question, often it's asked, you know, how often do you think about suicide? Every time you ask me. You know, I, I, we measure health so negatively, right? You know, I, 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 I've been trying to extend my health span by working out with my parents. It's something that we do. And, you know, I'm not sitting there every day saying, wow, I'm only a, you know, a 50 on the push-up scale and I'm so depressed I could reduce my disability to get to the point where I'd be functional. No, I'm trying to get stronger. Can't we try and get stronger in health? Can't we have more resilience? Can't we seek resilience? These are positive things. This is, you know, we make health so depressing. Let's make it a little more positive, and, and maybe people will engage with us more. So I'm going to show you what we built here. This is our website. Um, uh, and um, I'm going to search for MS patients. And so I'm starting now. And uh, by the way, I invented this when I was online dating because I was getting divorced, and I was running a trial. And I said, you know, cross a trial with a dating site. So. I couldn't do BMI in the dating side. It was really frustrating. Um, so uh, I'm filtering patients. I'm, I'm choosing women between the ages of 35 and 50 with MS. It's a dating site. Um, I want someone that's had MS for a little while, so no newbies. Um, 
you know, so someone says it's, you know, somewhere between something in 15 years, 7 and 8 and 15 years. You'll notice the patients are all different. Some are green and healthy, and some are yellow or really orange and, and really unhealthy. So I'm now saying everyone in the second quintile of disability, so the, you know, people that are, you know, um, uh, not, not healthy but not so sick, that they're just on the edge of working, so just like me. And I'm going to click on the top patient here and, and go take a look at it. And uh, here comes the patient, and you can see their history. Now, this is our a view, and you can see their... You can go full screen with this, actually. Um, and you can see their MS history. Uh, you can see the treatments, Gantt charted. Engineers love Gantt charts, by the way. We live by Gantt charts. Like, you know, what, what's the cause and effect thing? Um, you know, imaging and, and symptoms. Look at the richness of this data. By the way, we're talking here about five years. Who's run a five-year MS study? Anybody? Multiple drugs, natural history. Um, I can now look, click on fatigue, and I'm suddenly now looking at 80,000 people. You know, and, and you can see the level of fatigue, and I can look at that in all people or just in MS patients. And I can click on a drug like ProVigil and look at how people use it. And it turns out that in our system, you know, MS is one of the really beneficial uses. A lot of MS patients use it. We're the only evidence base for that. It's never been run as a trial in that population. You can see the dosage. I can do the dosage in MS versus the dosage in the rest of the community. This is the kind of data we collect on this quarter million volunteers that have said, I want to share my health with everyone so that we can learn together. One of the cool things we do is we download the entire clinicaltrials.gov site every night so that we can match patients to it for every condition within 25 miles of their house. And we have some work to do to increase the coding because it only works for certain conditions. We have to make it match better because I don't want to waste the patient's time. I want to tell them about what's relevant and give it to them, and that's what we want to do. Um, and, you know, in our own data, it was really interesting. In our clinical trial study, 93% of the patients, you know, remember, 20% of them didn't want to go do the trial again. They, they didn't like it. 93% of them want to help the drug industry do better trials. It's our product that we're offering that we've announced as, as a part of our suite that we work with people on. They want to be your partner, perhaps on their terms. So one cool thing about making patients partners in the research process is rather than keeping them behind the box and sort of ignorant and out of control a little bit or subjects, whatever terminology we use, we, we measure that they actually get better. So this is people that just showed up and hung out on our website. And, and, we, and they better understood their seizures. This is an epilepsy. This is work we did with UCB. Uh, it was one of our first and most innovative and uh, aggressive customers. They're wonderful, a wonderful group of people. And we looked, they understood their side effects. They managed their condition better. They were more adherent. They gained control over their seizures. They reduced visits to the ER. You know, anyone, if I had a drug that did a, a you know, a, 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 an 18, it's actually 18%, sorry about the number 21, 18% reduction in ER visits and epilepsy, I'd be a rich man. I mean, this would be a really good thing, right? But what's also neat is that they're not doing this by directing medicine themselves. They're seeking better care. You know, there's a wonderful story about a woman on our site that ended up getting to an epileptologist and getting a surgery, and she'd never seen an epileptologist in 17 years of having epilepsy. She didn't even know it existed. So we're driving to better care in the system, not the patients directing it on their own. And that's a good thing. This is a study we've now replicated now with the VA in their population. Talk about a difficult group to work with. Um, and, and we're getting similar results when we work with their population. Um, we study things across disease. So we've looked at insomnia across all kinds of conditions. We did some work with Merck. Um, but this is a broad application. You can see here that, that in patients with chronic disease have a dramatically, I mean, I've never seen a result that strong, higher level of insomnia than the general population. So much so that it changes the way you think about the disease. And in our data, age and gender are no longer um, uh, predictive of insomnia. It's how many comorbidities you have. So the idea that the older you get or that women have more insomnia is actually not true. They just have more conditions and they have more issues as you get older. Um, but because our data is so big, this is 75,000 people, you can stratify the severity of insomnia across conditions, and those are the error bars. I mean, you know, this is really tight data. So we know that ALS patients have much lower insomnia than fibromyalgia patients. Well, that's obvious, right? You know, that's it's not surprising, because fibromyalgia is considered potentially to be a sleep disorder. Um, 
This is uh, our data from what people use. Um, one of my favorite data points, uh, since we're in the state of California, I can state this because it's uh, approved, is marijuana. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a neat ratio here. Uh, marijuana has 40% a, a of the market share of Ambien. Um, and secondly, it has a higher I tried it and I still like it ratio. So you can see the, <laughs> you know, the commercially less successful drugs on the right-hand side and the more successful ones on the left. Um, you know, and, you know, interesting ways of looking at treatment. But what's also interesting, the patients try really cool cocktails. They try really wild things. Um, this just gives you a sense of the kind of data. We have about 50 data points on almost 100,000 people now that are cross-correlated at multiple time points. So you can do some really amazing stuff looking at sort of sex life or depression or any variable and begin to look at these interrelationships. And remember I told you about phenodynamics or, or systems um, phenotyping. Um, this is looking at the variance of fatigue and insomnia. And obviously, you know, kind of obvious, you don't sleep, you're a little fatigued, right? There's a relationship, and there is a relationship. Um, we also look at things like the temporal relationship of a symptom. So this says, if you have a certain symptom, how likely are you to change state? Because the, you know, some symptoms move in curves, and some are changed at any point in time. And that allows us to really quantify the expression of the human condition with math instead of a story in some way. Um, now, I talked at the beginning about signal, and I showed you some neat measurement approaches we have, but it's not just enough to measure. You have to predict. And prediction is about building models. And if you think about what a good doctor does, a doctor looks at you, and they're amazing, amazing heuristics engines. They're unbelievably well-trained to understand multiple variables. And they say, this feels about right, or you're doing about as expected, or you're doing worse than expected, let's change it up, you know? And, and that's what a great doctor does. But math can do that too. So this is um, a program we call internally called Ceteris Paribus, which is we try and correct all variables for all other variables. And in this case, we solve for insomnia, which means if we know your depression, pain, fatigue, and anxiety, how well can we guess your insomnia level? And the answer is 38%. Um, which is pretty good. And that's how we saw that showed that gender and age weren't factors in this thing. We did this kind of math. But we also do projection models. Um, you know, my brother had a stem cell transplant that uh, we did at Jefferson um, uh, uh, under fully regulatory compliant uh, conditions. And um, he was the second patient. And I, I didn't have any way of knowing whether Stephen did well or not. All we could know was that it was safe. We published this. We're one of the primary references for a lot of the stem cell work. And um, what was depressing to me is I didn't really know. And after Stephen died, uh, a physicist and I in our lab started building a predictive model. And what this model does is it goes and it matches controls. So this is one of our match control prediction algorithms. And so this is going to um, go and make a prediction for Stephen by picking patients. You know, all these patients lived eight, nine years after him, except for that one, it was interesting. And it's now building a control group for Stephen of 10 patients and making a projection for the year. And if I adjust the time scale, can you guys do that with your clinical trials tools? It's kind of cool, isn't it? Stephen went exactly as projected. So after he died, I knew that the stem cell transplant had no impact on survival. And I got to talk to the patient that's still alive, that's stabilized, to ask Cool question, why are you better? You know, that's what prediction does. It says, who's doing better than expected? And I loved at the beginning when um, Minnie was talking about the, the, the foundation of this thing. Those that know can share information to those that need to know. And then when you think about a partnership with patients, you think to yourself, I can share things we know as an industry with patients. And you can, but you know what? You need to know what they know. You really do. Because they've got answers to your problems. And if you can figure out how to stop spending six to nine month development cycles and really integrate the patients into your decision process, you will change the way you do business. We used this model to, um, uh, back in 2010, call the results of a trial. So there's a trial in ALS that showed that lithium made patients live longer, and it was done in, uh, published in PNAS, and hundreds and thousands of patients started taking lithium immediately, off-label, 
And we were able to show, using our predictive model, our matched control algorithm, that lithium did nothing. And we published this, uh, and we actually knew the answer before any patient enrolled in the four follow-up studies that all failed for futility. I'll repeat that. We observed the use of a drug in a population, showed that it had no effect before any patient enrolled in the four follow-up studies, and we had more power in our observational study with bias and other issues than any of the follow-on studies. Now, we published this in uh, the BMJ in January, uh, uh, and it's a paper titled Subjects No More. And the reason we did this is that there's three drugs in here I want to tell you about beyond lithium. The, the light blue line in the bottom, the big broad one, patients were drinking sodium chloride because they thought it would modulate their immune system. They literally read the patents of, 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 a, of a drug company called Neuraltis. They read their patents, and, they, and they, they said, the ingredient is sodium chloride. Let's drink it, and we'll get the same effect as the drug. And they were talking about in the forum. They talked about they were getting better, and we knew that they were getting worse, a lot worse. And we, we you know, with very wide error bars, we published this to stop them from doing that. But we also published two other things. And, you know, uh, people from Biogen in the room, um, the, the red line was Empower. And we had 40 patients of your thousand in our system, tracking data in our system at the same time. And, uh, and you know, and my friends at Biogen, and your, your great company, got together with us, and they, they, we, we got together, they said, look, we've got these results, and we're going to publish them. We're going to tell, you tell us when the last patient is submitted data, and we'll put it online. So we published it the day after the last patient submitted data, and we showed that there was not going to be a clinically significant effect, or at least with a broad curve. And I'm not saying it was a, it was a perfect prediction, the other one is a company that we had 66% of the patients in the phase two study, and we have more power in our data than they did. We have significance that the drug actually has an impact. They don't. So, you know, this, and this shows that, that that drug should move forward. So we're now calling trials with this observational study using predictive algorithms and measurement in the real world. So... That's interesting, and, you know, and we, as part of our service, are now doing the math to help design better trials. How can you, you know, use predictive modeling to do better matching and control groups or maybe eliminate some placebos in some phase two so you can make better decisions and do trials more cost-effectively? That's great, but I have a bigger goal because at the beginning I said I want to really understand disease. I want the biomarkers, and I want to understand disease. And, and in understanding disease, we have to think about there's some things we don't know. We don't know anything about the relationship of the virome and disease. We don't know anything about the biome and disease. We don't know anything about circadian disruption. Circadian rhythm regulates 25% of all transcripts in RNA, and we know nothing about clock disruption and disease, even though there's ample evidence that many diseases have clock disruption, and we don't collect or use this in our trials. We don't know anything about neuropharmacology, our innate levels of different drugs and things that are matches to what we use in, in the real world. We don't know anything about the chemicals or the metals or the toxins in our body or our mitochondrial function or the level of stress or the sense of agency or molecular age and telomerase and methylation. We don't know any of these variables, even though all of us know they're important to health in the context of trials. So we need to understand this to move to this golden age. And the only way to do that is going to get away from this model where we run a study. Because the silos aren't working. The silos aren't working. The data is disconnected. What I'm asking for is a world where, starting with a quarter million, maybe then a million people, maybe then 10 million people, that we phenotype everything about them that matters to them in a quantified, unified model, that we connect that to all the biology that we can now measure with increasing precision and lower and lower cost at twice the rate of Moore's Law. We stand here at the same age that IBM did when the personal computer was invented. And you know what IBM said at that point in time? They said, I think there's a market for maybe three or five personal computers in the world. Are you going to be 
So the companies, as companies or individuals, we have a choice. Will we be the people that say there's a market for three to five personal computers in the world? Or will we be the market that says twice the rate of Moore's Law and Discovery, the existence of human networks, we better get on this bus and become part of the app ecosystem, become part of the discovery system that patients will build with or without us. Um, I had dinner last night with Larry Smarr, who's the guy on the bottom, who's now measured you know, hundreds and hundreds of different variables over his lifetime, over the, over the last few years. And he tracks his biome, his inflammation. Um, he looks at his genome. This is personalized medicine where you know, he, he built this entire thing called the hyperwall to visualize his own data so we can understand it. That's patient one. And we talked about this future last night. And on the top is a guy named Michael Snyder who published um, a, a paper about how he measured everything about himself. And he, he got type 2 diabetes in the middle and he showed a relationship to getting a, uh, a, a, a cold, so a viral infection that accelerated or exacerbated or initiated type 2 diabetes. Now, there's issues with the science and all of this. It's all N of 1 stuff. And there's maybe 20 people in the world that are starting to do this. But I, I want to envision a world where there's a lot more people doing it. I want to envision a network that can take apart this broken discovery, you know, inefficient, unbelievably expensive, and not particularly... Uh, delivering value development system. Um, the healthcare system itself, which doesn't seem to measure whether or not anyone does better, let alone how well they do on the medical errors. I want to replace this with a new system. I think that we can do this as one. We can do this by measuring everything meaningfully on everyone. Let's start with some volunteers. We can do this by measuring everything meaningfully on everyone. And we can use that to inform what we do now, our development process. How do we do better trials? How do we make better decisions about what endpoints to go for? How do we figure out better ways of measuring disease with PROs or integrated instruments? We can build models that allow us to see into the future and give medicine the tool to say, instead of the doctors saying, I think you're doing as well as we should expect, this is what the math says we should expect. We can build ways of stratifying us so that we know the difference and the similarity in each of us, mathematically and rigorous. But the best part about this is to think about doing it not as I am the industry and I will build my study and I will own it. The way to think about doing it is there's going to be a network of people that will move into the future. And that network of people want to be your partner. They want to go with you. They want to be your best friend because they know that you will deliver them the drug or the answer and you have insights and knowledge and things to teach them. The question you have to ask is, will you join them on that journey? It is really not about how you bring patients in so that you can teach them to be better or teach them to understand. It's about how they can teach you how this future networked world can take us all to a better scientific space. That's what will give us health span. My um, background uh, was, you know, neuroscience, obviously, after engineering. Um, and I, I love the brain. I think it's a, an unbelievably beautiful tuned instrument. Uh, and as an engineer that spent my life building things that were supposed to connect and work together, I, I was mystified by it. And what I was mystified by was that nothing worked the way it was expected. It didn't have processes that said, this is what you're supposed to do. It didn't have, you know, a set of rules or command and control. It's this distributed democratic system that finds out what's going on and it feeds the information to the right part. And it connects that and it's made up of millions of components that each add value synergistically. It's collaborative, and there's competitive forces to make the system, you know, reach the right conclusion. And to my mind, it's a model for what the network of health care that we can build that requires us to integrate that. And there's structure in the brain. You know, there's things where you learn about layers, one that, that receives information and one that converts that information to to sort of integrated meaning, you know, if you go up the visual system and then ultimately forms from, you know, uh, photons to lines to circles to faces to that's my mother or my brother. 
And then there's a system on part of the brain that converts that to actions, to thinks about things that invents, creates our consciousness. You know, in this networked world, we have to figure out how we connect ourselves in this, how we figure out how to bridge between the patients and the industry and the scientists into one whole that works together. The regulators are going to have to think about how they live in a world where we can imagine a thousand new drugs every year, maybe 10,000 new drugs every year. That's the world we can build if we unleash this ecosystem, the strength of your skills and resources and innovation and the power of hundreds of thousands and millions and then tens of millions of individuals in one process. There'll be a lot to figure out, a lot of risk in this world. Um, but it is something that we can absolutely do together. I um, study history a lot because I think that you can learn from the past how to build the future. And I love the theme. I mean, it was an incredible honor. And, and also, by the way, a statement of just how forward-thinking forward thinking the, the DIA and the industry is, that, that, that this transition to the next century, next half of the century, is built on the principle of patience as partnership. It started that way. That's what started this, a partnership with patients. And we grew apart. And now it's about coming together. And that forward thinking is, is going to require each of us to reach inside and find out what we can do to think about a rule that might not make sense, a process that in another era someone thought of but we shouldn't do anymore, a chance to reach out and invest at risk without knowing the answer. And the industry has a history of doing this. It reinvents itself continuously. And the next generation of the industry is going to be the network between the human condition and the industry itself in a new way. And I'm very excited about what that looks like. I, I just want to read this because Kennedy nailed it. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade. Specific timeline. And to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One that we are unwilling to postpone. And one that we intend to win. Intend to win. I am unwilling to postpone this future. Someday, a Stephen will be diagnosed with ALS. And because we built a network that learns, because we built a way of synergizing a currently siloed system, they will not be afraid. And I am unwilling to postpone that. And I invite you to join us and I mean us, is in all of us as patients in building that new network together. And I hope that you, like me, are unwilling to postpone it. Thank you.